Morning, guys. Ken at Tortoise Capital. This is the Foundations check-in for um, November 26, 2023. Just um, came across this very nice uh, rendition of Manjusri, the gentle Buddha with his sword that cuts through <laughs> illusions. He's the uh, he's the patron bodhisattva of uh, scholars and uh, teachers and students and thinkers. So the, receiving gentle wisdom from his sword. I've always enjoyed that idea. Um, given thanks this, uh, this Thanksgiving. I, I didn't get any uh, questions from you guys, so I wanted to just hit some highlights, figuring we were all probably in that kind of post-Turkey shock. Um, this one is a, um, a beautiful pencil sketch um, that was commissioned by one of our students at a research weekend who was struck by the water metaphor, the whole water ecosystem approach um, to trading. And uh, really, it really speaks to me. The uh, the idea of um, mystical wisdom, basically. Um, up here, coming in the mountains. Uh, being trapped in a reservoir of wisdom that we can contemplate and think about and which and regulating that flow of water all the way down to the mill which has a real uh, powerful imagery for me uh, the mill is sort of what enables civilization um, because it takes a community to organize one and it grinds all of the grain from that village, from that region, harnessing the water power and uh, allows for specialization and allows us to store things in the grain, grain warehouse and to engage in commerce with the people in the, in the city and to trade for their crafts. Um, we can store it in reservoirs for agricultural purposes. The drive shaft on that mill is what ended up enabling the Industrial Revolution because they turned that into a power takeoff shaft, which drove all the spinning jennies back in the day. And that was sort of the um, that, that's sort of the anchor for everything uh, civilized in the world. And then the evaporation takes us back to the to the clouds, and that that whole water cycle has a lot of a uh, lot of meaning for me. Yeah, wouldn't surprise you to know my dad was a hydraulic engineer, and so I used to spend a lot of time with him describing water power and fluid dynamics in the car going to and from work. And I grew up in a machine shop um, making parts for automotive systems, for brakes and uh, air conditioning, you know, that people kind of relied on. So I, I learned uh, industrial quality control at an early age from the bottom up, where everything they were doing to design the manufacturing system was geared to prevent a monkey like me from... Uh, screwing up the quality of brake systems, you know, when I think of the people driving on the road to and from home this weekend, relying on their automobile brakes, and I re remember what it was like to be in the machine shop making those parts, um, taking a thousand pieces of aluminum tubing um, and turning that into and putting a 30 degree bend on it at my station 
you know, a couple thousand times a day and trying to do that without making errors. So the whole idea of industrial production and repetition and systems under control leads to that mindset that I use to this very day in um, trying to regulate my behavior in trading systems and accounting for the monkey that's in there running the machine. I don't know if you noticed over in here these uh, these guys kayaking down the rapids. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> One of the central features of our approach is um, this gradual release of responsibility model uh, in which over time I'm trying to move you away from we're starting with demonstrations where I'm giving you the patterns and showing you methods and you're kind of on the receiving end uh, and then moving towards shared demonstrations I would, I'd like you to think about that as the um, working in the in the chat room or in the bar by bar workshop is probably the best way to think about that where um, I'm setting up the trade frame and asking you the questions and you're answering questions about hey, where do I want to where would I put my stop now and how would I say so I'm doing the framing uh, I think of the chat room as the guided practice where uh, you're posting your charts and talking about the things that you know we're thinking about where you do and I help where the community helps you and then independent practice where you're doing things posting your charts and you're engaged in the operation and so we can think about that relationship of the teacher and student about how we're doing our various roles in each of those four phases. Um, and I adopt the mentality of the nursing profession, I suppose, where you give just enough help and um, to keep you moving. So that let the body heal itself, let the body learn. So this, this model of teaching is the one that I've adopted uh, for our practice, because I believe it's the one that we want to get to that gets us to here. Uh, it's, it's nice to enjoy a feeling of understanding where you watch what I'm doing and you feel you understand what I'm doing. But what we want to get you to is where you are... Um, self-managing independent practice using resources acquired through the other phases of the process responsible for the outcome with uh, our community providing clarifications and support Uh, these are snapshots of various integrations that we did through the online hybrid workshops and you know trying to um, communicate what we're doing and thinking so this one the way of the sword to me it feels like the way of action um, when I get up out of my true story circle my base and I'm trying to take formal action in the world to make changes the way of the bowl being that those moments of reflection uh, inside inside some true story circle or inside some trade where I'm trying to make sense of the uh, the action so if I think of the way of the bowl and the sword then is the integration of action and reflection and that's the the essential insights of action research which combines uh, acting in order to learn and then reflecting upon that learning in order to improve action that's an iterative cycle and that's no different than the price cycle 
through its little waves. Um, and uh, learning to grind. Uh, f you know, when, when you're taking action in the world, you're getting blisters and calluses, and you got to learn to take care of that. And um, there's a feeling that goes along with that. I mean, just this Friday, the thing that I enjoy most in the world is playing soccer with the little kids. But, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you know, I kept thinking, man, it's it's going to be the day after Thanksgiving. I'm going to be full of turkey. I'm not going to feel like playing. I'm going to want to just enjoy, you know, watching some movies or football or whatever. What are some reasons I could cancel? I could legitimately cancel practice. And... You know, I was using my imagination to come up with those things. But I remembered little four-year-old Omar, my buddy. I knew he was coming to practice, so we had practice. I went over there and just had a blast uh, enjoying it. I even went early just to make sure that if the gymnasium was locked up, I had time to call the security guards to come unlock it at the university field house in order to avoid the excuse of canceling practice because the building was locked. So part of learning to grind is recognizing that that little devil's always on your shoulder, whispered in your ear and just saying, well, I'm just going to do the right thing. There got to be more reasons to want to do it than reasons not to do it. I was thinking about that last night. I was, uh, as I was watching the Barry Sanders documentary on Netflix, Bye Bye Barry, you know, he, after 15 or 20 years, whatever it was, out of the game, 15 years, his he finally did an interview to explain why it was, and he said it. He wrote a fax <clears throat> to the Lions, typical Barry Sanders. He did not hold a press conference or make a big deal. He wrote out a statement and then faxed it to the Lions, and it said bottom line was, his desire to be out of the game was greater than his desire to be in the game, that the passion to keep playing was no longer there and it was time. So he just said that, he faxed it to him and it was done. And that was a guy that learned to grind. He knew how to grind, going to work every day and getting it done and not no big hoopla, just doing his job. So I, I think of that, the way of the bowl and, the, and sword as really learning to grind in both of those dimensions. I'm reminded that uh, there's a time in every fight where both guys think they're losing. That comes from, from judo and jiu-jitsu. If you think of the way of the bull and the sword as the battle against self or the battle with self, um, the angels of your better nature and the demons of your darker nature in that eternal struggle for our intentional living. There's a time in each fight, in every fight, where both the angels and the devils think they're losing for the in the struggle for your soul. Uh, so keep learning to grind, you keep going. That's what I will say, just learn to grind and keep going. And remember that there's a time in the fight where you think you're losing, and so does the other guy on the other side of the trade. This is, those are the moments, those compound critical states, where that manifests each and every time. And to me, this pattern here says it all. This individual trade is just one of a thousand that we're going to take climbing up the hill, going to work every day. And that's our equity curve, too. And the essence of our entries in the SSC, Supported Spring Crossing, is there had to be some period of time that was just horrible. And everybody that was in that trade felt horrible owning that thing. And when they stopped selling is when that starts to reverse. This thing will keep going down as long as there's people that are willing to sell their position. And it just keeps, and they're suffering every moment until they decide to sell their position. 
and then that RL10 reverses. And that's going to be where the, uh, the PSAR flip is going to start. You know? That's where that path up, up uh, is going to start grinding. Uh, and then there will come a moment when that RL10 um, when that RL10 enters the dragon and crosses the dragon and then there's that moment where the um, where the dragon reverses and starts to slope up as it starts heading towards the owl, right? So this this whole region in here is the reason why there's a trade because there's so much feeling going on. All the people that are in despair that are selling their position until there's nobody left to sell. And those traders come over to the other side, well, maybe it's time to buy. And the two price levels that we think about, there's the belly of the RL10. And the belly of the dragon. I mean, either one of those, when they get violated, is something we would call a collapsing dragon, where instead of gaining, it's going to reverse and resume that, that selling pressure. So we know that's always there. And those are the precise points where we can make those decisions. But then when the price that RL10 gets through the dragon, there's some temporary calm where the buyers are still tentative. That it's We're still getting tentative buying pressure through here. And it's not until it breaches the previous swing high that we get the emerging dragon, that it is truly broken out and we can expect to gain, gain ground. And if that's what the curve in price looks like, that's also the four seasons of MACD histogram, if I'm being honest. You know, winter transition to spring, summer, and then fall. And so that's planting in the spring and harvesting in the fall on a trade basis, but that's also exactly the same pattern that we see in the four seasons of MACD. And if you think about that, uh, that water ecosystem, that's just the winding of the river, finding the path of least resistance through the territory as it moves towards the sea, you know? And so all we're doing is identifying and living with natural processes of the human beings that are involved in the buying and selling routinely. And at every place on that river and every bend of the river, uh, our people are living and breathing and working and, uh, and trying to have that relationship with the growing of crops and the running of the bulls and living peacefully and working together, all of that stuff. Uh, learning to grind if you think about the conventional wisdom on that and all of the uh, motivational speakers and all that the Gary V's of the world and all that they talk about that as a painful man you gotta get in there and learn how to grind and again grit and all that or you just realize that what you're doing at the mill is grinding. A natural process where you gather grain and you put it on the millstone and bring the other millstone on top of it and use water power to turn the wheel and to, uh, to get the grain. That's just, that's just work. You know, you don't have to put your hand in there and gr get it all ground up and don't, you know, don't get caught in the millstone. Don't drown in the river. But grinding, I, I'd like you to 
not think of the pain elements of that, but think of that as really just the um, uh, learning to grind in the same way that the you know the miller learns to mill, and the farmer learns to farm. And that's just doing the job, understanding what work is, uh, taking pride in the craft, and learning to recognize craftsmanship in yourself and in others. One of the reasons to engage in a process of craft knowledge is to learn what it looks like from the inside and how it feels and craftsmanship leaves marks and you can learn to recognize that in others. That's one of the reasons uh, the, the PhD work and scholarship and academic work has a payoff and uh, it is conventional wisdom in the world to laugh at you know PhDs who don't know anything because they know so much about so little and that's I guess not surprising by people who haven't gone through that but if you ask a PhD they know more than anybody how little they know about the sum of human knowledge but what they do know is what it means to grind uh, to grind through this learning process to try to actually know something about the world uh, they know what that process is like and how hard it is to know anything there's a really good video on that from uh, uh, Feynman the physicist who says I in talking about science he says I know how hard it is to actually know anything about the world you know he was talking about social science and and, uh, and what it means to grind and so one of the reasons that I think it's valuable to you to learn these foundational lessons is that you can learn to recognize uh, knowledge and skill and craftsmanship and excellence in others because you know what it means uh, to learn something about how systems work and how hard it is to find something that works and then the questions to ask of somebody who claims to know how to trade or who has a system that they propose to lease to you or to run for you to manage your money is you know what kind of questions to ask and to know to ask, where does your edge come from and why is it persistent and how is it robust so I would invite you to think about uh, that the process of mastery is just mastering that little diagram right there that's everything it's your emotions Um, it's how you measure progress through time, different phases of the seasons, and realizing that, there's a, that there is seasonality and how the market changes and how our systems change to adapt to the market. Like the market, is, as it changes, the systems that were working aren't working as well and other systems that weren't working are starting to come into season and so we got to manage those transitional states that's what's happening down here and how we think and behave in those moments are different than how we act when it's starting to work when it's really working when it's harvest time in the same way that we go through tasks and responsibilities in these different phases of learning you know we're going through those kinds of phases in the trade and if you think about the market being your teacher you actually 
can replace teacher and student with market and trader. And think about how you progress from observing things that the market is doing as it tries to teach you in the only way that it can through price action and volatility and progressing towards the moment when you have a rule-based system operating in alignment with what the market is teaching and telling at any given moment. And if you think about it, the, uh, you know, the volatility is not even the market speaking. The market is speaking through price and price alone and the change in price. The volatility is coming from the people who are responding to the changes in price. You know, the volatility is also the rate of change and the magnitude of change in price. And that is reflected in the emotionality of the people responding to that. That when you get more changes in price action, that extra energy is generating heat. And that heat is being transferred into people's emotions, and that's why they're acting the way they are. That's why the shorter the shorter the time frame, the more important that volatility is. This pattern that we're looking at right here is nothing more than the cycles of cycles of prices and rates of change uh, as it goes through the seasons. I think one of our key advantages is recognizing that um, is the fractal nature of these seasons and that is I just I just happen to pick these uh, because they make sense to me it allows me to see the unfolding of the seasons going through time three minute 30 minute daily three day and nine day and that the same patterns are repeating that's how you know they're anchored in nature and humans so when you learn how to view price action and the change in prices through time and the people's reactions to it through that lens what we're doing is we're at a point of view over here looking into the world of price action from outside and it's an it's an an act of intentional behavior you know to decide to go into that and that's one of the choices that we have is I'm out here and now I'm in the trade and now I'm out of the trade. Uh, remember that there's, you are not the trade. The trade is something that you're doing, some intention that you're doing. And that there is some unchanging element. You know, there's the you that's outside this trade. And then there's the you that's working inside that trade and comes out of it. So you've got to be able to keep that separation from what's going on. You got to be in the trade, but not of the trade, if I can say it in that clumsy way, that there's always some coach's eye. That's why I spend the time talking about developing the coach's eye so that you can observe your own behavior inside that, inside that uh, circle. And so this is the unchanging part. You know, there's you that's not in the trade, then there's you that's in the trade, then there's you that's not in that trade. There's some ele essential element of you that's unchanging. Your identity, your values, your intentions, your rules and behaviors, your standards. But there's also a part of you that's changing that the way you behave in there and what you learn from the reflection in the way of the bull is going to change you through time. So there's a changing and an unchanging part of yourself that you've got to accommodate. And it's not one or the other. And that's reflected to me in this idea of the way of the bull and the way of the sword. There's part of you that changes and part of you that doesn't change. And the part of you that's changing is an intention.
Yeah, uh, Greg asked me, uh, you know, comment on bullets and stops. One of the ways that you can regulate that behavior is to say, look, th my view of that is a, is a distortion because I'm outside looking in. I can't know everything. I can see things that are external, but I can't see into the hearts of men. And so this idea that I've got four bullets, I got four chances with today's money. And and look at I've got uh, if I'm going to trade five days this week, or I'm going to trade for a thousand days, I've got a thousand blue boxes of, of money that I'm going to trade. And I got so I got four bullets that I can use for this day and still be under control. And what I'm doing is I, each day I go to the market, I'm testing, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going through a test. Can I align myself with the market? Can I stay with it and learn what the market is saying today? Can I read the market and what it's doing and where it is in these different, in these different seasons? And can I do the right things in those seasons? Well, part of that is, is the market behaving in my time frame? You know, which, which lens am I looking at? If one of these lenses isn't working, then maybe I got to shift. Hey, the three minutes not working. I got to go to the 30 minute. And what does that look like on, on the daily? Maybe that's the one that's working or that's the, the time frame to make the decision. So it's not unusual to have multiple time frames working but also multiples not working like could i could just be in sideways quiet channel on the threes but that could just be some place where the market is turning on the 30 and so i could be stalking there and i could be making a decision here and maybe it's time to make the decision on the 30 and when it's when the 30 starts moving it turns out that now the 3 might be coming into time frame and now i'm really making sense on the rule of the day so by regulating the amount of ammunition i'm going to shoot each day i'm putting a little governor on this little monkey that wants to jump at every opportunity and say, no, I've got to have some impulse control that I'm only going to get four shots at it today. Now, as long as those are working, like if that thing is working and I cash a good trade, then I've got some evidence that I'm in alignment. And I can keep trading forward because as I make bank, I can take that and put that in the bank, and then that one becomes an active bullet again and when things are really going well and i've got all four of those things in the green i can't add more and run away with my enthusiasm because the market could change on a dime and now suddenly i have too much risk and too much exposure so this idea of the four rings or the four bullets i realize with my emotional self that I've got, I've got to have enough money to stay in this game for a thousand trades or a thousand days or a thousand weeks. Hey, what's a thousand weeks? A thousand weeks is 20 years. If I'm going to be in this game for 20, that's why to me, the weekly review is so darn important because you're looking at the performance of five days and on each one of those days I had four bullets and each one of those bullets was one more trade opportunity and I can keep taking those trades until I run out of bullets or I run out of time and time will pattern and money and by learning to have the, have this common view that view of the trading activity is common to all of those time frames 
And so I can become very efficient in my style and in my approach. And I, frankly, uh, as, I, as I toy with other ideas and other things, um, those have no power over me to act. Those are just things that I think about and I'm going to research and get to in all good time. Um, but I've learned through my experience to trust this lens and those time frames and those processes that I'm comfortable with the uncertainty and the tension and the, and the grinding of learning. I just know that that's what it feels like when I'm learning. And you just learn to live with that. And to take comfort in the fact that I'm glad that it's hard to learn how to grind. Because if it was easy to learn how to grind, then everybody could do it. And then think how hard it would be to trade in a marketplace when everybody else on the other side of every trade, 100% of those people have learned how to be efficient and grind. There'd be no edge. So the fact that you're seeing those oscillations is simply telling you that there's other people over there who haven't learned to suffer yet. They haven't learned how to lose properly in order to learn, in order to scale when you win. That's just, uh, at, it seems so pro profoundly obvious to me that I just, I almost hate to say it, except that it's if there's anything that we know, that, that that seems to be where the edge is for our style of trading. I'm not saying that there's not other edges. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, other people find ways to trade in ways that I don't understand. I know that. I'm not trying to trade their way. I'm trying to trade my way through learning because I want to be around for 20 more years and 1,000 more weeks. To me, the, uh, these lenses, understanding the volatility and why I care about very quiet and very noisy, those are the two elements of volatility that give me an advantage because I think my edge consists in understanding how to trade those turning points and how to frame them and how to find moments of entry and how, how to frame that trade for short-term and long-term advantage and how to manage that until it gets back to something like fair value. When my edge, and then when it's back into normal volatility and contentment, my edge is gone as a trader. Maybe I, if I was able to get on board early enough, maybe I can just ride the train that somebody else is driving with long-term buy and hold with some portion of my, yeah, sure. I know what to I know how to trade when the thing is just moving that's not to trade. So this is just another way to express that the regression line crossover framework and learning to grind and learning to get aligned. and learning how to frame the specific trades so that if I am able to get the SSC, then I know what a Kata 2 looks like as things are calming down. I've already got my positions in. And then if it breaks out to the upside, I know what those different four stages of confirmation look like. I'd like to be able to get in here, but if I can't, then I know how to play the breakouts at four different levels of breakout, knowing that each one is a trade-off, that the longer I wait to get in, the less of the move is available. I know that. So I've got to learn how to grind. I've got to learn how to suffer through wins and losses in this area, and I have to learn how to suffer through the analysis of it in order to discover where the edge is because the edge is subtle. If it's not subtle, then it's easy to spot and then everybody will do it. 
So in the foundations, we're starting with that supported spring crossing. And it leads to an owl and then to cotta twos and up the chain. But if it fails, it leads to collapsing dragons all the way down. But at some point, it stops failing and it just gets into this sideways quiet channel, which we do not trade because that's where the crocodiles chew you up. Until the Bollinger Band means compress enough that it gives us a Z3 pinch, which we can frame. And so I know where to spot those opportunities by trade location. They're at extreme overbought. In extreme oversold those are the easy ones in the look back periods but also when things are exactly in the middle that's what the Z3 pinch looks like is things went high and they went low and it settled down and got very very quiet that's what a Z3 pinch and a Z3 super pinch looks like and in all of those I'm expressing it as a reasonable reward to risk ratio that I can articulate on a simple diagram and show you why I think there's a reward to risk. And anybody that can't explain what the obvious reasonable reward to risk is in this time frame, according to our lens, doesn't understand what we're doing. I think you can apply that to the same that to the same the same uh, lens or the same question as a consumer to anybody that proposes to manage your money. Explain to me what your edge is and why you think it's reasonable and why you think it's robust and how you know that it's working and what will happen if it works and how do you take partial profits if it stops working halfway through the trade. That's the RL90 in the green. That's that Confirm it has to get through the dragon and across the 90 and up to the 270 when it gets back to fully valued like it was before and then our edge is over. You got to be able to express those ideas out loud to yourself when you're taking those trades. I, I really want you to uh, add that to your process. Are you really framing the trades? Can you see the obvious reward to risk ratio in the trade that you're taking? You have to see that first before you get in here and start putting these little, and maybe I think it's probably, I have not emphasized that enough. You know, I spend so much time thinking and expressing those rules. Oh, it's the PSAR flip and the little yellow box that I think, I now in retrospect, I would say as a teacher, I'm failing you, because I'm not saying it's the larger trade frame is the precondition to all that. That it's the fact that there is an obvious, powerful, normal reward to risk ratio available in both directions. That's what that's the uh, the acorn that we have here is that there's this obvious move up there. If you don't see the obvious move up there, then it's not a trade frame for you. The fact that there was a harsh winter out of the opening, let's say, I, I, I want you to think about this as the OR3. That's an advanced technique. The OR3 is an advanced technique, which is based on the idea that there could very well be an explosive move that comes out of the opening. And that it could lead to the harsh winter 
that leads to the SSC. Yeah, uh, Greg says, yeah, there's a lot of potential targets, RL10 curves, high and low the past days, range stats, almost endless. Well, the fact that there's always a range stat in both directions from the open is the implied far distant target, yeah, which gives me the justification. But it also means that I got to be prepared to have a lot of uncertainty and reversals when, I, when I'm managing these small risk boxes compared to the size of the RL10 and to keep going. And that's why I don't get discouraged if I'm taking incremental losses or there's no follow throughs. I don't say, oh crap, what's wrong with me that these trades didn't work? It's nothing wrong with you. It's that's what the trades are like. That's what the trading day is like regularly and routinely. It's not about you. It's just those are trades that didn't work. Had nothing to do with you. So you've got to keep the larger picture in mind. That's the that's the uh, the trade that I'm trading towards is that far goal. And I know that there's many steps along the way. And that when they don't work, I'm going to feel like it's my fault, but it's not my fault. That's just what it's like when you're trying to trade in that region. Now, if it comes to pass that you say, I can't do that, then that's something you can't do. It doesn't mean anything about who you are as a person. Just that technique is not, is not for you. Maybe the technique that is for you is the owl that waits a little bit longer for confirmation. It also means that the amount of the gain is not as much. But that's one of the trade-offs that the owl is willing to make. It says the amount that is there is less than if I get the early bird getting all the worm. That's part of it. If it turns out that on that time frame there's routinely not enough gains in there for you to comfortably get, then maybe you got to go to that's just an indication that maybe the three minute is not for you. And then maybe it's the 30. And that you use the three as a guide. Or maybe it's the daily or the three day or the nine day. What we got to do is find, you've got to find where in the time frame you can trade with advantage. The good news is, in my view, that it's all the same lens. It's all the same lens. And you're just adjusting to fit. That's what I want to say about that. If you open my head at any given time, what you'll see is, in my inner decision-making process, This is the routine process I go through to make every decision. What is the purpose I'm trying to achieve with this decision? And then the next thing, where is the risk? Even before, even before I have framed the problem, Even before I've described the problem and named it or whatever it is, I'm, I'm thinking about my larger purpose and where is the risk. Now, is there a problem that I can turn into an opportunity? What's the right method to deal with that kind of a problem? Let me try to rapidly generate solutions that are good enough to get started on it and then put it into practice and then what kind of insights can I get from the iterative solution finding in order to make better and better decisions all along the trail and let those decisions lead to actions with continuous assessment so 
it's this idea of finding a satisfying, satisficing interim solution quickly. And this whole process is an open system, like an Enzo. There's things coming in and things coming out, actions getting out of it. That is the gateway to action. This is the gateway to new information. And those are open systems. So I got a guard information that comes from the environment, actors, forces, structures, and context. All these things keep bubbling in from the outside because this is an open system. There's things coming in here from the environment in the form of these little packets of information, these stimuli. As I'm going through this process, I'm getting new information. And that's leading to actions over time that I'm going to continually assess and monitor and try to get better. Now, these are the practical professional habits of mind that are my toolbox that I'm using as tools as I go through my craftsman's knowledge here. Intelligence preparation of the battlefield, understanding my terrain, understanding the risk, and understanding myself. The Uvidla process, understanding vision, described, decide, learn, lead, and assess, plan, prepare, execute, build learning organizations with other people that are mutually reinforcing, lead them, work with them, follow them, accomplish missions, stay ready, do my due diligence, perform my duty. These are the habits of the professional spirit warrior, the Dharma of the soldier, that are shaping unconsciously and consciously how I go through this process through time. That's the inside of my head. It's systems thinking in an environment, continuous information, continuous improvement, professional behavior, leadership with others, team building, teams win. That's what we're trying to do. And it's a learning organization. And then the things to learn in the ecosystem are these. You know, the top level plan, prepare, so that I'm ready to act and then execute, assess. Plan, prepare, execute, assess. Planning is just having enough things. Get me in the right area. Preparation is everything. The management team, the systematic processes, management of the to-do list, managing my alignment, making sure that my strategy is aligned with how I start acting to the tactics I choose in individual trades, learning in the body of knowledge, how to learn, principles to learn, the resources for learning, Managing execution, man, is that important. Learning how to assess properly if we survive. Those are, you know, all the lessons of the uh, foundations course are on that sheet in some way. You know. So I, these are the things that I'm grateful for. 
I'm grateful to continue to survive, to continue to learn and to teach in a community of practice that wants to learn and teach. And uh, this was a, this is the last one. This was a snapshot in 2020. Quick, list all the katas. You know, we said, hey, this is the day that we said, hey, kata is the right way to think about this. So here were the chunks. The hybrid fro the patterns, hybrid frog, the owl, collapsing dragon, emerging dragon, sideways quiet channel, and chain trading. Master these psychologies of the zero state, the second mouse, the owl meditation, build your house of trading and know your business, know where you are in the ecosystem, understand if you're a hunter or a farmer, or if you're both, which one you're doing at any given time. The multi-time frame, multi-lens analysis, the four seasons of MACD, regression line Bollinger Band framework, regression line fractal framework, pinch and stretch support and resistance. Techniques of framing trades. Regression line crossing the dragon. When am I at no lose plus dinner for two? How to frame the trade. Understand execution risk versus position risk. How to use the auto framer for swing trading, but how to auto frame any chart that you look at immediately. The auto framer does it mathematically, but those little templates I drop on there is auto frame it. That's the lens I look through. Understand a critical state and then how to synchronize different time frames with core and turbo. Understand the, uh, the mindsets of all these different little animals. What does it mean to behave like an owl? What kind of strength can I draw from the mindset of the owl, the tortoise, the monkey, the dragon, the crocodile, the cows that I farm, and the second mouse? And then these processes, plan, prepare, execute, assess, sustain, improve, action of the daily AAR, know your histogram, use the four column learning journal. This must be so important that I put it twice, sustain, improve, action. And then I would add, you know, time, will, pattern, and money to these processes. Right? Yeah, to our battle drill. I, I, I would agree. I wouldn't disagree with that. All right, that's everything I got for today. I'm open to your questions. Or I've given us enough to reflect on. How about you enjoy how about you enjoy your Thanksgiving and Give me really good questions for Thursday. That's what I want you to do. I want you to enjoy your Thanksgiving holiday. Go play in the snow if you got snow. Just kind of assess where you are. Check yourself. Where are you in that diagram? Where are you in your learning journal? What are the burning issues? If you had to do a mind map and just quickly crunch what would it look like? What are the things that you know? What are the things that you're working on? What are the things that you're curious about? What are the things that are mysterious? I, that's actually a pretty good, wow, well, what a very interesting four-column learning journal that is. That's the new piece of information. That's, it took me an hour to get to that.
where's my pen? Practicing. There we are. If you know it, you're acting on it. If you're not acting on it, you don't really know it. Then there's things you're working and practicing, things you're curious about and unknown. So if you had to do a... You got all of those things that were on the ecosystem and you're trying to move them over to here. That's the, the next book is the job book. We've got 75 skills. I got to get working on that. Is we've identified plan, prepare, execute, and assess in about 75 skills. And then we have, we've identified like seven levels of knowledge. And we're going to give you a job book that says, hey, where are you in each one of those? But in the meantime, hey, where did that list of 75 came from? Uh, started with this. So start with what you know, and what are you acting on? What are you putting into the chat room? What are the trade frames, and where are you in the... What's the minimum pathway to trade a trade so that you can put a chart in the, chart in the chat room? So if your goal is to put your first chart in the chat room... You know, what's the what's the first thing you got to do so that you can get a chart loaded into the chat room? The first one is hard until the second one. The second one's harder than the first one because now you know something about it. But the second one is the hardest. The third one's easier than the second one. And after three, it's just a habit. Do one chart a week. Post a trade in the chat room, get feedback on it, and make that part of your weekly ritual, and check that off your weekly checklist. Hey, this week I posted a chart and I got feedback. Awesome. And when you post a chart, post a good chart, by which I mean it's complete. Not that it was a winning trade, but a chart that is complete. With your comments and your assessment, and your estimate of what you think I'm going to talk about. That's then you know your chart's complete. Your trading plan is clear. You you followed the rules. You took the trade. You saw what else there was to see. You documented your results. You learned the lessons. You've updated your learning journal and your action journal and your to-do list. And then you posted your chart. Come at me, bro. Then that's how you know. Okay. All right. Take good care, guys. We'll get this published and posted, and uh, have a good rest of your weekend. Joe, I just propose we uh, we pick up on Tuesday with creativity, with your permission. Thanks for everything. See you later. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Take good care.